I think we are now live. Hello, everyone. We have another seminar of the series uh, doing ecological economics. And today we have uh, with us uh, Professor Georg Meran, who is uh, yeah, a professor in environmental economics at the Technical University of Berlin. And uh, together with me, it's also Luis Son, Ken, uh, who wrote. I will pass them uh, the baton so that they can introduce themselves uh, properly. And I am Paula Novo. I'm a lecturer in ecological economics. And between Luis Son and myself, we will be co-hosting uh, this seminar, this webinar, which will be focusing on the on uh, Geo's, uh, one of the most recent published papers in ecological economics. The title is Green Growth Possible and Even Desirable in a Spaceship. Uh, economy. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, we will be launching the discussion, but everyone is welcome to ask uh, questions uh, from the audience. And the other thing is that the paper is going to be available for uh, a few more days, uh, open access, so that uh, people can kind of go and have a look and, and read it. Um, so, uh, Lisa, do you want to quickly introduce yourself and then we'll pass to Georg? Well, yes, thank you, Paula. Uh, hi, everyone. Happy to uh, be here again. So my name is Luis Onkainfo. I am an assistant professor of economics at uh, Roskilde University in Denmark, uh, where I uh, teach and research in particular ecological uh, microeconomics. And uh, Gerard, now you and if you can also tell us a bit about your um, research work more broadly before we kind of zoom in into the paper. Okay, many thanks uh, specifically for giving me the opportunity to present myself and, of course, thanks also for reading my paper. <laughs> and uh, let me talk a little bit just for half a minute or one minute about my research areas. Mainly it's water economics, what I'm doing together with some colleagues here in Berlin, integrated water resource management, questions of water tariffs, water rationing, and specifically, of course, uh, access to water and so on. We have, uh, we have written a, a textbook about that, which is open access. Um, then the second field of research is ecological economics, which is a broad field, of course. There I've dealt a lot with green growth, what it means uh, in the framework of theoretical models. And then also I have done a lot of work in the field of ecological economic modeling, let's say, starting from Lotka Volterra to behavioral and institutional economics in the sense of, let's say, um, Samuel Bowles or others, evolutionary game theory, and uh, also, uh, which I think is very important, identity economics, uh, questions of uh, uh, environmental awareness and so on. Uh, then, of course, theory of fairness, equality, equity, and things like that, which have more and more importance, which we can see also when we have our lectures and uh, courses. Uh, students want to have uh, these uh, problems of fairness, equality, and so on uh, within the courses. John Romer, Michael Sandel, Marc Fleurbet, and so on are very important people in this field. And last but not least, and I think this is also very important nowadays, institutional economics combined with political economy, asking not only questions about efficiency and things like that, but also political power and uh, uh, problems of exploitation and so on. Here we have very uh, famous uh, researchers like uh, Doran Asemoglu, Herschel Grossman, Alberto Alessina, and many others. Well, this is my research area, and uh, well, then uh, perhaps I turn to the paper, is it? Yes, uh, yeah, thanks a lot for giving this overview, like so many fields and uh, so many interesting things. And now, yeah, if we go, go kind of delving a bit into the paper and if you can provide a short summary and the key arguments and, and messages of the paper. Thank you. Well, uh, what I have observed over the years is that there was a big consensus among uh, growth theorists and also resource economists in the mainstream that green growth in the sense of perpetual growth is possible uh, if you apply a certain kind of uh, investment strategy, not only in physical capital, but also in um, human capital. And then, in a sense, you can um, uh, have forever growth 
And uh, I think a couple of years ago, let's say two years ago, um, I found the first time doubts about that in the mainstream. And one of uh, the famous uh, uh, researcher uh, is Pater Descripta, who, who wrote a report on biodiversity. And when you read this uh, report, which is open access, yeah, then you find uh, doubts he has raised about uh, the possibility. And my question was, how was it or is it possible to derive green growth as perpetual growth and sustainable growth within the theoretical models? And uh, if you look into the literature, you find, uh, let's say, beginning in the in the 90s, the first endogenous growth models combined with resource economics, Edward Barbie, Lucas, Lucas Bretschka, and many others. And uh, they all came out with one message. Whatever the uh, planetary boundaries are, you have the chance to have growth forever. Yeah, it's only a matter of uh, uh, of allocating the investments in the right way. And uh, this is astonishing. And um, my question was, where does it come from? And I ended up that it, in my opinion, uh, rests on this certain specification of production functions, mainly Cobb Douglas and CES. And the only thing the paper tries now is what happens if we take other, uh, let's say, not, uh, let's say, uh, more exotic production function, which in a sense, uh, take into account physical laws. Here, the Linux function is uh, mainly the one who uh, obeys to these laws. And if you insert these in standard neoclassical models, everything breaks down. There is no green growth anymore in the, in, in the future. Of course, you have a trajectory for a while, but then you end up with zero growth. Even if you have human capital, and even if you have a smart um, substitution uh, strategy, whatever it is, you end up uh, with zero growth. And uh, this is due to the um, parametrization of the production function. Also, if you take into account that uh, growth needs space in the sense of Kenneth Boulding, you know, the spaceship economy, and it takes more and more space to produce, then you have a sort of an ecological displacement effects, which exacerbates all these results. Well, then I tried also to compare this with the standard resource models and various uh, uh, kinds of production function. And always I ended up that zero growth is the result, even in a neoclassical model, if you take this Linux function. Well, that is uh, more or less uh, uh, it, try to derive. I, yeah, I wanted to follow up in, on something that you mentioned, which is the implications of the using different uh, production functions in. Uh, uh, in uh, if uh, maybe maybe before before following up on this, maybe uh, if we have a few uh, followers who are not completely familiar with production functions. Uh, a good point. Uh, yeah. do, you mind, do you mind recalling briefly what a production function is? Uh, in neoclassical economics and why is it so uh, so important and uh, maybe also what is the specific uh, uh, par parameterization that you uh, that you refer to thank you yeah well if you look in this uh, kind of literature which deals with green growth with resource economics be it exhaustibles or reproducible um, resources, it doesn't matter. You always find two specifications, the very famous Cobb Douglas fun function, which is very easy, more or less. Yeah. And uh, this might be one reason why it was applied always because you can handle it very well. And then the more complicated one, which is a test, test production function as a constant elasticity substitution, which has a uh, property that it has substitution elasticities also uh, less than one, which is important. and. Uh, Funny enough, in both cases, if you have a proper strategy in uh, uh, innovations, in uh, trying to push forward resource efficiency, whatever you do, and also pushing up phys the physical capital, you always end up that uh, limitations in terms of uh, resources availability is not a problem. Uh, it, I think it, it began in the 70s and 80s, you remember the famous um, uh, limits to growth report by Meadows and Meadows. And um, 
you know, they ended up that, well, I think in 50 years, everything is gone here on Earth. And, on Earth. and these models were called uh, lethal models by the mainstream. And it was uh, a couple of uh, um, mainstream economists in those days, specifically Robert Solo, who answered to these uh, 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 modeling of matters and matters and specifically questions the result due to the fact that these models didn't take into account the possibility of substitution. And the whole story is about substitution. So try to get rid of uh, resources by accumulating various sorts of capital. And um, the question remains, how far can you push the substitution? And the answer is within Cobb Douglas functions and SES production functions properly um, specified, uh, you can go such far that you always al almost do not need any uh, resources anymore because you can push forward uh, ad infinitum the um, substitution by capital. And uh, this is due to the mathematical properties of these functions. And I think if th there were a lot of um, production, there was a lot of analysis also in ecological economics, which showed that these production functions uh, contradict to physical laws, uh, mainly the first and second thermodynamic law, and also uh, in terms of the mass balance approach. Of course, we, perhaps we will we'll talk later about uh, the switch, what the mainstream did to get rid of this critical uh, aspect. It's about services, but we talk about later. I, I don't think, I don't know. But anyway, if you take these production functions for the energy sector, you, you would fail. So I really don't understand why uh, uh, over 20, 30 years, these production functions were mainly used in uh, resource uh, models. It's uh, a matter of, uh, let's say, uh, historians one day to analyze and find the reasons for. Perhaps it's very similar to the old um, discussion uh, uh, when we had the, uh, the contest between Cambridge and Cambridge. And you remember these uh, discussion ended up that uh, uh, Cambridge America US ha had to um, give in and uh, in a sense, the production function was uh, killed by Cambridge, England. But nevertheless, from the 60s up to today, we use these production functions. But this is a different matter now. Yeah, so I, I guess you partly answer one of the, of the questions I, I had. Uh, but like, yeah, so if I like, the production functions that you mentioned, the Cobb-Douglas, and it says they allow for, in theory, full uh, decoupling. Uh, but given the lack of uh, evidence that this is like possible, uh, what would be the you know the arguments to keep using these kind of functions in in growth models, if, or we should move completely from them? Well, as far as I see, I would say. Of course, for, pra for practical reasons, you can use these uh, uh, conventional production functions, Cobb Douglas and says no problem. But you should keep in mind that they are only applicable for a certain interval of time. You can't uh, 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 build up scenarios where you say you have forever growth. You can take this as an approximation for a couple of time, let's say 100 years or 50 years, uh, how to see how the economy is going to develop in the, in, in the course of uh, investment strategies. But you shouldn't take these, uh, in my opinion, you shouldn't take these production functions as uh, a mean to derive endless growth. I mean, then you get uh, into trouble with uh, physical laws. That's, that's the main point in the paper which is shown. And therefore, I've taken up a, a production function, which was well introduced by Robert Ayers, I think, as far as I remember. And he applied it to the energy sector. And quite clear, if, you, if the output of a production process is, uh, let's say, energy in joule or kilowatt, whatever, and the input is also energy, then, of course, it's one to one. And uh, these physical laws, it gets more, let's say, uh, difficult 
uh, if you talk about social product gdp what is it exactly is it sort of a service is it is it pure material there of course you have uh, a possibility to talk about that could we take um, the production function in terms of let's say service units then you don't uh, underlie all these uh, physical laws perhaps perhaps yeah that's uh, the discussion i think so but uh, on the other side i think if we uh, it's a bit of a trick to say we only look onto utils whatever it means that's out of, the output is utils but what is it exactly yeah um, um, I had a discussion these days with my students and we were pondering about uh, is it possible to have pure service without any bit slight as possible with a slight material base it's like having a let's say a mobile a smart mobile it's getting thinner 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 yes and on the other side um, you will have one day you will have um, a lower bound of physical uh, expansion of these devices. But on the other side, uh, the possibility you have with these uh, mobiles is increasing and increasing. So one trick would be to say it's, it's uh, pure service. There's a notion of Herman Daly, who could be very ironic if necessary. And he said, this is angelizing growth. It's like the angels here. Yeah? and. Um, I don't believe. I, I think it, in the end you have uh, a physical base. I don't know how much, but there is a physical base. And uh, Cobb Douglas and says in their application in resource models, they end up with zero at the end, almost zero. Yeah? That's, a, that's the difference to Linux. It makes a lot of difference. I mean, in my Linux production function, I really assume that the physical base is very low, very, very, very low. But uh, the model uh, skips and uh, the standard results couldn't be reproduced anymore. Yeah, I think that, that's the main point. And, and of course, one has to ask now, what do we have to do now? Uh, if this uh, critics uh, raised uh, is somehow, let's say, legitimate and uh, takes into question these, the application of these standard production functions, of course. Yeah. Maybe just uh, before uh, going further, uh, we can we can remind that uh, I mean I think your 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 example of the mobile phone is interesting because uh, uh, studies have shown that uh, to produce one mobile phone, uh, which in average will be about two hundred grams, right? Uh, so to produce one mobile phone of two hundred grams, uh, we need uh, in average about seventy three kilograms of matter. Uh, if we add together. It also the hidden flows, so for instance, the ground that needs to be mined to extract the material that will then be in the phone itself, you know. So that shows also the, the difficulty of the decoupling because it's not only about the material that compose the final device, but it's yeah. about all the materials that are uh, wasted, so to say, uh, along, the, along the supply chain. So it's uh, it's an interesting point. But uh, Paula, did you did you have a question? Because otherwise, I had an immediate follow up question on this. Uh, yeah, no, I was I uh, want to ask if you wanted to follow up. Um, yeah, because uh, I think the, the 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 issue you mentioned a bit like uh, the difficulty of uh, dealing with utility and uh, so like the the outcome, the output, so to say, is uh, utils. Uh, but this is a this is a, a subjective theory of value, right? So could we? Uh, to be a bit like the, the devil's advocate, could, could, couldn't we say that ultimately it's, a, it's an individual decision? Um, if I decide, for instance, that uh, I suddenly I'm much more satisfied with my mobile phone, I get so much more utils, uh, then we could have in, infinite growth uh, if, we, if the subjectivities of people uh, change. No? Like, uh, so my, my follow-up question then would also be, uh, if we take like the core neoclassical framework uh, and uh, really considering the, the utility theory of value, uh, does it make even sense to talk about limit to growth in that uh, in that setting? I mean, uh, this goes back. It's a sophisticated point, uh, and uh, there were already uh, economists, resource economists in the '90s, who 
who raised this point? Uh, Siak Smuldas was one of the first one, I think, middle of the 90s, 95. And he made the first time these, uh, distinct, he distinguishes between the, uh, the material base we were just talking about, and on the other side, what he called um, not the physical production, but the creation of use value. Or what he also, uh, or synonymously, uh, econo economic value. And this is kind of uh, the um, completely mass free, uh, well, use and uh, uh, yes, of uh, services which uh, give uh, utils. But then you have uh, to abandon the production function and you write a utility function. And within the utility function, you can perhaps insert a let, let's say a household household production function in the sense of Lancaster, something like that, you put it. Uh, and then you can try to say at the end, uh, I'm living like an angel, but then uh, in a sense, the, if you do this and you can do this, uh, no doubt, and then you take a utility function, Cobb Douglas utility function instead of a production function, then you end up at the end with zero growth. So the neoclassical models would also propose uh, zero growth in the end. Um, I, I would, and perhaps there are, the, perhaps then the differences between ecological economics and mainstream are not so big, but currently it's not so discussed. Currently, uh, I find that uh, the trick is applied that we have sort of asymptotic processes where we can get rid of nature and at the same time, we are hovering over the world with a big growing economy. It's, yeah, I think angelizing growth is a, is a nice notion for that. And I think uh, at the moment we, we uh, it's very sophisticated to say it's only the util which matters. And it's uh, almost tautological at the end, yeah, I would say. And uh, if you look in the policy realm, not in the theoretical one. Uh, GDP, the production of uh, welfare, is understood as material welfare, more or less. People want to have houses, shelter, food, cars, mobility, infrastructure. I, I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, see that we have one day all these um, items which are important for welfare completely um, material-free growing. I mean. So th there might be some places where you have complete material free uh, services. Yeah, going to the psychologist, perhaps, to make an example. But uh, for many things, uh, I think you need really um, a certain kind of material base, which you cannot get rid of. And uh, Cobb Douglas and says makes it possible to get rid of. Uh, and uh, I don't know how the, how the impact is uh, in the uh, in in the policy policy arena. Uh, if you come if you come out with the result that we have no problem with green growth, we can go further. I mean, uh, what do we observe now? We have uh, the tr energy transition, and everybody says, "Well, we get rid of CO two emission, but uh, uh, by substitution." But the substitution is very um, uh, mass connected, mass connected in terms of lithium and uh, rare earth and things like that. Yeah, there are, there are often confusions between uh, uh, the, the low carbon transition and dematerial, dematerialization. And uh, I mean, even for instance, uh, building from your example of uh, going to the psychologist, one could say even this is material because the psychologist is a person made of uh, <laughs> made of matter. So uh, uh, it's very hard to think about something that would be purely immaterial. Uh, once I read about someone saying, for instance, if we start to make money uh, on the on the on the metaverse, for instance, that would be immaterial. But I would disagree with this because even the metaverse uh, is uh, somewhere uh, on a physical hard drive using physical energy to be to be powered. So it's not uh, what is virtual is not necessarily uh, immaterial. Uh, and I think that's an important point. And uh, when we look at the data, for instance, when we look at the data on material flows. Clearly, the uh, uh, servitization or tertiarization of the economy, so the move away from high income, uh, of high income economies from industry towards service, was never uh, accompanied by uh, dematerialization. Yeah. Quite the opposite, actually. 
quite the opposite. Uh, I, I mean, perhaps we have, perhaps we have such uh, things like a Maslow pyramid, you know, perhaps. Uh, but uh, I think the biggest share of mankind is uh, in this pyramid, very uh, not, um, on the top, where you have the basic needs to, to be met. Yeah. And uh, the basic needs are always connected with with material, with resources. Later, because if you are very rich, perhaps there are some uh, uh, services which could be completely material free. But I think uh, in terms of the whole population in the world, I mean, uh, most 90% uh, of all uh, products and services are materially re related. So, um, so for practical reasons, uh, I think uh, we should really talk about uh, production in terms of uh, material intensive production. Uh, and also, I, if I may, uh, uh, I would like to uh, indicate also this ecological uh, replacement effect, which I was talking about, displacement effect, sorry, uh, which uh, is put into the regeneration function because in my model i've assumed uh, optimistically that we have uh, regenerative uh, resources which but uh, if the economy the global economy is growing and growing the space for generation for the nature is shrinking and shrinking in terms of hectares for instance yes something like that and if you put this displacement effect into account then there can't be uh, growth forever because the infrastructure pushes away the reprodu reproductive capacity of the nature of course look in brazil and wherever it is in the agricultural sector it pushes away the microclimate and things like that so there's a trade-off which is not taken into account in in growth uh, models and in uh, resource models of the mainstream yeah, maybe about that. When I was reading your paper uh, and when you mentioned this displacement effect, I was constantly uh, thinking about this, uh, this study that came out. Uh, I never remember if it is in science or nature. I will look the exact reference. I will post it in the chat uh, about two years ago where uh, a team of scientists calculated that the uh, total mass of what has been built by humans uh, now exceeds uh, the total mass, uh, the total biomass. So uh, yeah. the total mass of organic uh, uh, organic uh, matter on, the, on Earth. So that, that gives an idea also of the uh, order of magnitude we are dealing with when we are talking about those, uh, those issues. It's really, really huge. I mean, you know, there is uh, this, uh, this vision of Edward Wilson, this biologist. Uh, it's a bit of a utop utopia, but ne nevertheless, I think it's interesting. And he proposed the half-Earth concept, which means that more or less half the world, the earth, should be exempted from um, being uh, under the laws of economy. It means it's just na pure nature, more or less. And then he proposed to look over the world where these places are, which are most valuable in terms of, uh, let's say, um, natural capital and so on. And uh, the distribution of these places in the world is very uneven, unfortunately. And it depends. The question remains, of course, how could you install such a project? And of course, much more difficult, how could you monitor that? But, uh, but the basic thinking is very interesting to say, we need uh, space for nature. Uh, and uh, this is not put into account in the uh, conventional models, resource models. And it makes a big difference completely. It changes completely the, the results completely. There is another tension, I think, there, uh, because the models also rely on like population growth, right? That's my understanding. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, there are lots of problems with that. No? <laughs> if, if particularly if we start to think about like those um, uh, displacement effects. Yeah. Um, so how can this be? And, and I think in the paper, you explicitly say that this is like another kind of big topic and you don't go into, yeah. into that because it was outside the scope. But can you kind of give us some thoughts on how this could be taken yes. forward? I mean, there were always this fight between, let's say, Ricardians 
and Malthusians, more to speak it this way. The one saying that uh, population growth is in itself very good because you have a bigger pool of intelligent people who can, um, who will find new innovations. And also in the agricultural sector, you have uh, uh, from, uh, you, you might remember from Bozerop, these approaches where um, we say, um, the more people are there, the more you can apply technic uh, technical devices in the agricultural sector to increase uh, the agricultural output and so on. Whatever the reason is, there are two kinds of uh, growth models. One which I applied, so-called so semi-endogenous growth models, where uh, if you apply it with um, the conventional production functions, you get per capita increase of income due to the, an exogenous, exogenous um, uh, growth of population. Fantastic. The more people are, the higher the per capita income. You can't imagine, yeah? And this is due to the fact that these models are spaceless. There's no problem with space. So, uh, of course, then you can have, uh, due to the technical advancements by many people, you can have these uh, results. And then you have the other models, uh, in uh, which are two sectors models there you have also under certain circumstances per capita growth forever even if the population is constant yeah but i took the first one just uh, this is sufficient to show how these production functions work in these models to show that uh, of course uh, the, the endless growth of population cannot uh, lead to uh, endless per capita growth, per capita income growth, of course, yeah. And uh, it's amazing. It's like a perpetuum mobile to say, uh, the more people on earth, the more per capita income. Isn't it amazing <laughs> in a sense, yeah? But it, it, it all uh, hangs uh, on uh, these production functions, I think. Well, and then there's also no, a very interesting turn in the literature, which say, yes, we have population growth, it can't be endless, but then we have endogenous fertility. And the moment we have a relation between wealth, well-being and fertility, then everything um, organizes itself. People get more rich, people have more welfare. In that moment, the wish for, for children uh, decreases and everything will somehow settle down with 2.1 children per woman and then we have a constant population in the world because everybody is rich and we have only to go through the whole system through the whole Kuznets curve at the beginning of the Kuznets curve when the per capita income is very low there's a lot of uh, emissions a lot of uh, uh, use of resources but the moment uh, at a critical value if uh, the per capita incomes uh, income is increasing and increasing, then suddenly, that's a Kuznetskov story, uh, then uh, the impact on nature is going to decrease and decrease. And that's the optimistic view that everything organizes itself. We only have, you can say, uh, to solve the ecological problem, we need growth. If we follow the Kuznet curve, and that is uh, also in my 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 view uh, very critically to observe in a sense i don't know i don't believe really and uh, one has also to ask what is the carrying capacity of the whole earth is it um, 20 millions tw sorry 20 billions or uh, 10 billions where do we converge to this um, zero growth of population if everybody in the world has sufficient well-being and um, I think um, this is too optimistic to rely on this dependency between individual well-being and wish for children uh, um, I mean it goes back to Malthus in a sense because Malthus had these uh, um, this self-governing process where he said the moment uh, people get better uh, uh, more rich, uh, and if the well-being is increasing, uh, Malthus said the the uh, 
then in that moment we will observe that they the families will have more and more and more children and uh, this has left uh, has has led to this malthusian um, um dystopia at the end and uh, the modern uh, theory of the resource economist said uh, and das gupta also observed this empirically is of course just the opposite round the higher the well-being the less the wish for children yeah that's what what we can observe and in this sense there might be a self regulation but nobody knows whether the self regulation is sufficient to not um, um, harm the environment too much where's the equilibrium yes and uh, beyond the capacity of the earth or lower than the capacity yeah and more or less so the population of course plays a big role and what we what we can uh, observe in the international discussion it was more or less i think for 15 years 20 years completely taboo to, to talk about population po uh, policies uh, due to perhaps it was legitimate because uh, there was always the notion and uh, and the critics saying that uh, talking about population policy is sort of neo-colonialism we in the north are discussing how many uh, how big the um, growth rate of populations can be in the south of course this can't be the solution on the other side i think uh, the question of population has to be raised again it was completely lost in the last 20 years and i I feel it comes back in the scientific discussion. Meanwhile, of course, it has to be in a way which is, uh, let's say, equitable. Uh, and uh, we we have, of course, uh, to react to the um, to the reproach that this uh, kind of discussion is uh, neocolonialistic, something like that. Yeah. I guess what makes also this uh, discussion a bit tricky is that. Uh, there is, of course, like a kind of democratic issue. Uh, who, who would get to decide uh, uh, who, uh, who, which population can grow or not? And we, we see the danger of uh, potentially yeah. falling into highly reactionary, uh, not to say more uh, policies. But there are other ways to stabilize population, progressive ways, for instance, uh, giving access to education and um, yeah. contraception to uh, every... Uh, 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 every woman uh, and things like that. But another aspect that maybe also makes the discussion a bit, uh, the population uh, uh, discussion a bit sensitive is uh, that uh, there are enormous distributional issues to be solved as well. And uh, that, that, that was a question also I had uh, because in, in your paper, in your, in your models, um, population is one uh, homogeneous uh, whole represented as, uh, as L essentially. Uh, um, but uh, in practice, we know that uh, there are enormous inequalities, uh, both in terms of access to uh, consumption and even basic, basic need satisfaction on the one hand, uh, and also in terms of environmental impact. Uh, and environmental impact that are both linked to our consumption, but also uh, to our investment. You know, like for instance, in the last uh, World Inequality Report by um, uh, Thomas Piketty, Lucas Chancel, and uh, other co-authors, they, they, they show it very clearly, notamment, uh, notably uh, Lucas Chancel, uh, that about 70% of CO2 emissions by, uh, by the, the richest people on Earth are actually due to their investments and not to their consumption. So my, my question uh, to you, Gert, uh, in that regard was like, how, how can we deal in, in this framework that you're exploring in your paper? How can we deal with distribution, distributional issues in relation to, uh, to environmental issues? Oh, well, this is a difficult question, of course. But my paper was only there was only one aim to show that within a neoclassical model with even distribution, simply the replacement of production function is, leads to completely different results. That's all, more or less, yeah. And now, of course, we can we have to talk about uh, uh, about distributional problems, and maybe there are two uh, two areas. The first one is within a country, uh, how is in the course of uh, let's say green growth, yeah, 
uh, investment in more e resource efficient uh, production methods. How does this, uh, re what is the re repercussion to, to the distribution? There's uh, recently, there was also a paper by Doran Asimoglu about that. And he made some observation, I think for the United States that the, uh, the increase in the digitalization of the production process in United States, uh, you could observe that um, the uh, economic distribution is worsened more and more. Yeah, uh, that's the one area we have to talk about it. This is beyond the question of what kind of uh, production function you take. I think this is a genuine um, research area. The other, which is also very important, is the question of distribution between countries or blocks. Yeah. And there's also a huge amount of literature. On the one side, you have this literature on ecologically uh, unequal exchange, which is growing and growing. On the other side, you have also very critical and I, I would say um, very um, concerned about distribution, uh, conventional models uh, uh, in the area of uh, the pure trade theory, which takes into account um, uh, uh, various forms of exploitation. I refer to uh, Chilinski, to Chilinski, for instance. She made very uh, interesting papers when um, uh, she introduced in the standard um, Heckscher Olin models um, institutional um, failures like open access um, resources and so on. So um, I think this is also very important nowadays. Um, in a time where we have global environmental problems to talk about uh, the distribution between countries. Yeah. And, uh, but this is as a, a, another research area, which is huge at the moment. But what I, I think it would be very fruitful if people who are more uh, familiar with these standard uh, trade models, would come together with those people who are more in the area of, um, let's say, uh, unequal exchange stemming from the 70s. Uh, there, I think it, it's it's an it's a sorrow for me that these people are not talking together. This is, would be very very fruitful uh, because uh, there is a, a, a branch of literature in the standard models which is very critical. And on the other side, uh, we have to talk about the appropriateness of uh, these ecological uh, unequal exchange models, which are purely physical. And this goes back to, of course, to the labor theory of value. Um, and uh, there's a big discussion uh, in the left sector, so to speak, about is it appropriate to talk about exploitation um, if we take the indicator of unequal exchange? I mean, John Romer is, uh, is very critical at that, or Marc Fleurbet also. They deny that exploitation can be expressed nowadays with game theoretical methods. We don't have to rely on unequal exchange. And so I think this should be taken up also, because um, my feeling is that um, despite uh, uh, many uh, contributions to this physically, ecologically unequal exchange, which is uh, empirically very interesting yeah but i think from the concept here uh, i think it depends on the labor theory of value more or less and there are deficiencies uh, and so we can be very critical in terms of distribution but then we can turn to other concepts um, uh, invented by john Römer and others uh, which do without uh, labor theory of value Okay, so this is about distribution. The, the, this would be very fruitful to bring people together uh, from these two blocks. Uh, I mean, uh, of course, we know that uh, in the mainstream, most of the researchers who work in the field of international trade theory, let's ask let's say are more mainstream in a sense, but there are some people who are very critical at that and by the same time uh, using and utilizing these types of models, inserting institutional defects, showing that international trade can also harm countries, you know? And Chichilinski, she's one of them uh, 
who invented that. <clears throat> yeah. I, I just want to maybe go back to the title of your paper, uh, because it kind of poses, poses a question, right? Uh, is green growth possible and even desirable? And, and I just wanted to uh, you know, get an, 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 uh, an answer that could be communicated to policymakers. So beyond like kind of the academic yeah. discussion yeah. about like the different yeah. you know, production functions and, and, and so on, uh, what will be the, yeah, the kind of yeah. the message given that it's still so prevalent, the idea yeah. of green growth? Personally, I would say it would be very interesting, let's say, on the level of uh, Secretary of State or in ministries, perhaps not uh, uh, the upper level of politician at the moment, but beginning to just talk about very openly yeah, about what does it mean uh, for a market economy, for a free society to have zero growth one day. Do we have to change psychologically, sociologically completely in the sense of the early socialists of the beginning of the 19th century and uh, live like priests? Or do we have really to talk about normal peoples who have their own interests? How could we manage to have a zero growth economy? And how do we handle distributional problems? Distributional problems nowadays in Europe are, are more or less solved by um, by uh, saying, well, we have uh, next year 3% of growth and in two years also 3%, something like that. So we can somehow um, uh, mitigate all the distributional problems by growth. But if you don't have growth anymore, how, how, do, you go, how do you deal with this problem of um, uh, distribution? And I think this is, in my opinion, a research project which should really be done. Just assume, whatever the, uh, um, whether it will be the case one day or not, just assume we have zero growth. How could we deal with these distributional problems? And this, uh, distributional problems will uh, occur because technology, technology is changing. And if technology is changing, getting more resource efficiency and so on and so on, how does the rep repercussion be in terms of functional distribution or also on the household level and so on? And I think we have to talk about that. And uh, I, could, I, I can't see at the moment that we talk about distribution for zero growth economies. We always talk about distributional problems within growing economies. And why not to have a research project only about zero growth economies, whenever it is going to happen, but not in a theological sense that everybody has to change his mind and so on. This is too much top down, but just with normal people who have their own interests, who are, let's say, neoclassical units, so to speak. And how do we have to deal with distribution in zero growth economies? I think this is very important, in my opinion. And I could, and so, sorry, and I, I couldn't find uh, any pro, uh, any project at the moment for that. If we talk about zero growth, uh, then you find uh, only approaches which are, let's say, very psychologic, like sufficiency approaches. Yes, it it addresses people with a moral standard to be sufficient and so on and so on. But I think this is not sufficient for a whole economy, not for Europe as a whole. We really have to talk about mechanisms, distributional mechanisms, economic distributional mechanisms for zero growth economies, in my opinion. If I, if I, if I may just uh, comment on this, uh, Georg, as there are actually a few works that start to tackle this issue uh, in ecological macroeconomics uh, in oh. particular. Uh, 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 there, there, there is a, the, the, the recent PhD thesis of uh, Antoine Monsfort, for instance, that amongst other things uh, uh, investigates uh, how to have a pension system in a degrowth, oh, yeah. for instance, which is a quite big, uh, big topic. Uh, and there are a few, uh, few other works that uh, that tackle this issue. But I totally agree with you that we need much more, uh, much more on this. Uh, uh, it has, of course, and what also is of importance here is that we can not solve uh, our problems in Europe or in some countries here in Europe uh, uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, 
outsourcing the environmental problem somewhere else. It, it must be a sustainable solution in terms of uh, all economies in the world, in my opinion. Yeah? And this is a huge task, I think, <coughs> we have to tackle here. And uh, I think we haven't done it. So, uh, in the mainstream, it hasn't been done so much at the moment, not enough. Uh, so we have, uh, and I think, uh, I think you can also uh, see it if you talk to students, young people, uh, matters and uh, questions of distribution are getting more and more important in the, in the discussion at the university. So we have to take it up. I can remember 30 years ago, if you uh, flipped through textbooks, there was no notion about distribution. It was not a problem. It was always efficiency, always Pareto efficiency. And if you were addressing the problems of distribution, it was always said, well, this is a political matter. It's not economic. But this has changed completely nowadays with the young economists, I think. Nowadays, you find a lot of uh, uh, contributions to uh, issues of um, fairness and equality and so on from an economic standpoint. And this is important, I think. And it is aggravated by the fact that we can't have uh, growth forever, I think. So I, I think uh, the notion of spaceship economy is very good. We have to have a research program for spaceship economies. And uh, to put it this way, yeah. And uh, it's interesting, I didn't know uh, when you mentioned these uh, work uh, in the, uh, what is it, wasn't in the post-Keynesian, uh, in the post-Keynesian, uh, uh, models these kinds of distributional problems. This is very interesting. Yeah, yeah. This uh, this ecological macroeconomics uh, work uh, typically uh, will be a model in terms of uh, post keynesian stock flow consistent models or uh, neo calestian uh, growth models. Oh, yeah. So uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, more post on the post keynesian side. Yes. But it remains to show that whether in the, I mean the post keynesian models, in my my opinion. Uh, are an alternative to the standard macro models, but in terms of including resource problems, they are more or less the same. They have uh, some input output co coefficients and everything is in terms of uh, uh, taking into account nature, it's not very different to neoclassical models, more or less. Yeah, uh, it's hard. It's really hard uh, to tell you agree yeah. with you. Some, uh, uh, just like some uh, neoclassical uh, uh, colleagues uh, do as well now, what people do more and more is to connect uh, typically stock flow consistent macroeconomic model, so expressed in monetary terms, to an input output module that, that is expressed yeah. in physical terms to try to circumvent a bit those issues. But yes, it is, uh, it is complicated. Uh, that is absolutely true. So, I mean, I mean perhaps uh, for a while it was. Uh, it was, uh, I think, for a while uh, in, in the time where we were talking about substitution in the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s, uh, those models stemming from Meadows and Meadows were more or less uh, not possible to uh, publish anymore in mainstream journals due to the fact that their substitution was not properly uh, taken into account. But perhaps if we see that we have already uh, um, fully uh, uh, reached the uh, upper line or the bottom line of efficiency, then we can turn back to um, linear models because uh, there is no substitution possibility anymore after. So uh, perhaps we will have a, a sort of a vindication of these uh, input output models uh, in the mainstream one day, because uh, the moment we have uh, no substitution opportunity anymore, then we are more or less in a linear limitational uh, production world, yeah, perhaps. So we are approaching the last kind of five, six minutes of the webinar. And I would like to ask you, how are you planning to take this work forward or how other people could take your work uh, forward? Oh, you mean, uh, what, is the, uh, what is the next step? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Currently, um, I've stopped a little bit with these macro models because uh, we'll see how the reaction will be. Uh, what I'm, um, uh, I'm just at the moment uh, looking at is more the question, well, let me put it this way. If you look in the standard uh, uh, 
environmental economics models, often you have a problem of internalization and things like that. Then the second step, uh, the, the researchers ask, what kind of measures do we have to take? And then you introduce, let's say, a certificate market or, as, or you introduce a sort of taxes or fees or whatever. That's the usual way. And um, that's it. And uh, But who is going to implement that? Well, the state, the good dictator, whoever. We have, uh, in my opinion, the mainstream has not enough ideas of what is the black box of the public, of the agency, of the state. We have the, the good dictator who is going uh, uh, to somehow find uh, the right taxes, the Peugeot taxes and this and that. And then we have to regulate the market economy. OK, but uh, at the same time, uh, we somehow think that the state will function. But we know uh, since uh, public choice was invented, so to speak, yeah, that the state is also self-interested and uh, let's say corruption and things like that many things and what you can observe meanwhile is um, that there are some economists down asimoglo and so on who tried to, to put this uh, into their models the state is going to be endogenous our models at the moment in the in the mainstream of environmental economics is exogenous is just uh, providing some instruments and they have to be implemented but how shall they be um, implemented well somehow but i think we have to have a theory of how a state is going to work we have the theory of failed states of of uh, low capacity yeah and i think this has to be introduced in uh, our um, policy models of environmental um, issues and uh, I think there are some steps and Daron Asimoglu is one of these and um, this has to do also with a microeconomic theory of power and uh, we can do this but uh, for some reason we believe always we have to regulate the market and only the market but we don't have and who is going to regulate the regulator and I think this is a, for many countries specifically where we outsource our problems with weak states uh, we know what for uh, what for problems then will rise take plastic export i mean it's the best example we get rid of plastic and we export it export it to countries where we have weak uh, administrative structures and uh, then the problem will arises in those countries. I mean, power, political power and so on should be taken into account, I think so, yeah. I wanted to ask uh, Luison if you have any kind of last minute questions or if anyone who is in the audience has any kind of last minute questions. Well, just maybe a remark. Uh, I mean, based on what uh, you were saying, uh, just like now and what you said before, between like a necessary dialogue between uh, amongst economists of uh, different uh, approaches to economics, I think uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's important to to remind that to tackle those issues, uh, uh, it, economics should not only be applying existing tools, but also maybe questioning existing tools in light of the current situation. So uh, be reflexive, and also of course uh, enter into meaningful dialogue with other social sciences. Uh, I very much liked your remark uh, uh, just one minute ago about power. Uh, and uh, it's true that economists is rather scarce when it comes to uh, conceptualizing and understanding power, but other fellow social sciences uh, have a lot to say. So this would be one, uh, one interesting avenue for integration of economics and other, uh, other social sciences for sure. Yeah, that's good. I think uh, I think that the time is ripe for that. And uh, there are people who are also, um, and this was also what I tried with this uh, paper, uh, to, to bring together both sides. Sometimes there was always these blocks between neoclassical or mainstream and ecological economics. It's not necessary. I think that we, we have a lot of uh, interfaces we, and we can put people together. Yeah. 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 So... Thanks a lot, um, there for spending this hour. I think like the well, the topic is so prominent, and I think it will become more and more uh, in the next years. And some of the issues that 
arose here around inequality, distribution, power will be things that we'll have to, to discuss. Um, so I think with this, uh, we will close uh, the webinar to finish uh, on time. And thanks uh, yeah, everyone who was in, in the audience. And the video will be available on the uh, International Society for Ecological Economics um, YouTube channel. And Gero's paper is still open in the Ecological Economics uh, Journal for a few more days. So if you haven't read it, now is the time to do it. Um, have a good evening or morning or night, whatever you are in the world. And uh, see you soon. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Georg. Thanks a lot for having this uh, invitation. Many thanks for your comments. Thank you.